very unassuming manner during the time when Quirinius was governor of Syria. A baby was born in a small town outside of Jerusalem to a young woman. Years later, when trying to recall that birth, very few could remember it. A small band of shepherds were there at the beckoning of angels, while sometime later a band of travelers from the east were led to the child by a star. But that is all we know of his birth. We know even less of his childhood, other than a family pilgrimage, which found the young man lost in discussion at the temple. He lived the next 30 years in virtual anonymity. But a bath in a small stream and 40 days wandering in a wilderness where he faced his own demons would change all that. The next three years were quite a trip a journey that would ultimately lead to his demise. His many followers would tell you that he did nothing wrong, unless, of course, you find fault with healing the sick, feeding the hungry, raising the dead, and preaching about the love of God. Yet these very things ruffled the feathers of the religious leaders who, out of jealousy and anger, manipulated the populace and the political powers in order to have him put to death. So in a very public manner, during the time when Pilate was governor of Judea, Jesus of Nazareth was hung on a cross to die as an enemy of the state. One of his followers said that he was the Word with a capital W, the Word become flesh. In other words, he was the incarnate God. Yet with his death on the cross, this claim and the hopes that he embodied for so many seemed to come to a screeching halt. But on the third day of his death, on the first day of the week, all doubts about Jesus being the Word incarnate, the Son of God, were removed. For on that third day, women came, and they found the tomb empty. Peter, too, went to the tomb. He also found it empty. Later that day, Jesus himself appeared to them in person, first to two as they walked along a road, and then to all the apostles in Jerusalem. Over the next 40 days, he appeared to many, many more so that the world might know that God wins the final victory. Today, we celebrate with believers throughout the world as we raise our voices and proclaim, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah.
Hello there. I'm so glad you've chosen to join us for worship uh, this Easter season as we celebrate the good news of Jesus' resurrection. My name is Jeff Schlesinger. I am the pastor at First Lutheran Church in Lee, Illinois, and Emmanuel Lutheran Church outside of Compton, Illinois, two congregations which have agreed to share ministry and form Heart of Illinois Lutheran Parish. We gather for worship in person each Sunday at 8.30 a.m. at Emmanuel and at 10.30 a.m. at First. But as a result of the pandemic, we have developed a third uh, worship space, which you're experiencing right now, the internet. We put out these weekly videos for all who are un unable to join us in person. With these videos, we do our best to make you feel as if you are present with us for worship. Thus, we invite you to uh, follow along and participate as you watch this video. video. The liturgy is printed on the screen. The regular print is uh, for the leader, uh, and we invite you to respond with what appears in bold print. In addition, the words for the uh, music also appear on the screen so that you can sing along. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, we continue the worship by giving thanks for baptism, the very means by which we are uh, we are able to, as Paul says, join Jesus in a resurrection like his. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the wellspring of grace, our Easter, and our joy. Amen. Amen. Look, here is water. Here is our water of life. Alleluia. Immersed in the promises of baptism, let us give thanks for what God has done for us. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your voice thundered over the deep, and water became the essence of life. Adam and Eve beheld Eden's verdant rivers. The ark carried your creation through the flood into a new day. Miriam led the dancing as your people passed through the sea into freedom's land. In a desert pool, the Ethiopian official entered your boundless baptismal life. Look, here is water. Here is our water of life. Alleluia. At the river, your beloved son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By the baptism of Jesus' death and resurrection, you opened the floodgates of your reconciling love, freeing us to live as Easter people. We rejoice with glad hearts, giving all honor and praise to you through the risen Christ, our source of living water, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Look, here is water. Here is our water of life. Alleluia. Oh, 
First reading for today is from the 10th chapter of Acts. Peter began to speak to the people. 
I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us, who were chosen by God as witnesses, and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that anyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Here ends the first reading. Please read Psalm 118 responsively by the whole verse. Give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good. God's mercy endures forever. Let Israel now declare, God's mercy endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my song and has become my salvation. Shouts of rejoicing and salvation echo in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord acts valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord acts valiantly. I shall not die, but live, and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord indeed punished me sorely, but did not hand me over to death. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. Here the righteous may enter. I give thanks to you, for you have answered me, and you have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. By the Lord has this been done. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us, Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today's second reading is from 1 Corinthians. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. Here ends the reading. Our gospel for this Easter Sunday is from the 16th chapter of Mark. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus' body. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? And they looked up. They saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, 
and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb. For terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone. For they were afraid. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord, Jesus the Christ. Amen. I have spent most of the week mad, and the source of this feeling is rather unique. My anger hasn't been focused at the events in the world, though Lord knows there is plenty of reason to be mad at the events in the world. Wars, elections, famine. Some of you may be thinking, oh, Pastor Jeff is just belly aching about the busyness of Holy Week. But that's not it either. I have been super busy, but that has not been the root of my anger at all. I love Holy Week. I, I live for Holy Week. It's what we do as pastors. No, my anger does not stem from the chaotic week. There are times in most people's lives when they are just in a foul mood and anger bubbles up and is the predominant mood. But that's not it either. I haven't just been generally mad. No, I've been mad this week on account of a person. I suppose it's accurate to say that I am mad at that person, but quite honestly, it's a, a little odd to say that. You see, this person I am mad at is someone that none of you know, someone that I've never met, someone who is not even alive. Let me explain by sharing a bit more about how this week began and how this anger came about. Those of you who were here in worship last week or who joined us online for last week's worship video heard me share the story of the passion of Jesus. The passion, of course, is, is the story of Jesus' crucifixion, the events leading up to it, and the crucifixion itself. Each of the four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, tell this story in their own way. Since during this church year it is Mark's gospel that we use to guide our readings, I shared Mark's version of the Passion last Sunday. Now, Mark tells the story in a very dramatic way, and I think in a very powerful way. The events unfold in scenes that move back and forth between focusing on what actually happens to Jesus and to events that reveal the depth of faith, or maybe more accurately, the lack of depth of faith of those people who follow Jesus. The Passion is definitely a dramatic tragedy, the way Mark recounts it. For one of the disciples betrays him, one, perhaps the one who he is closest to, his best friend, denies him, and all of them, every single one of them, run away and desert him. Now, none of this is actually a big surprise, especially if this story is told after having heard the first part of Mark's gospel, which we've been working through during this Lenten season. For time and time again, throughout Mark's telling of Jesus' story, we find that the disciples are naive, dense, hard-headed, and even hard-hearted. It's really a wonder that these stories of Jesus were ever passed on, seeing as how hapless and hopeless the chosen twelve proved to be when Jesus was actually walking this earth. So last Sunday, it was a, a bit depressive to hear not only the demise of our Lord, but also the ineptitude of the disciples. 
But the thing is, we get to read the story knowing the ending. For we exist on the other side of Easter than what the disciples did. As we hear about their foolish actions, their sleeping on guard duty, and their fleeing from conflict, we know that it will end much better. Unlike the disciples, we know that the resurrection is coming. And here's the other thing. And this really stood out to me this year as I shared the passion story. Mark gives us a few people to put our hope in. And surprise, surprise, the suggested heroes are women. For as Jesus dies, his disciples are nowhere to be found, at least his male disciples. For they are off hiding in their little burrows from the Romans or the religious authorities or from whomever the boogeyman is to them. But Mark makes a special point of telling us that there were a few followers still looking on as Jesus died. Specifically Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph and Salome. And and again, Mark specifically points that two of these women, the two Marys, were witnesses to Jesus being placed in the tomb. And of course, this definitely fits in with the Easter expectations we have while hearing this story, for we all know that women came to the tomb early on Easter morning to find it empty. So last Sunday, I was doing just fine. Granted, I was a bit tired of hearing about how the disciples were such flub-ups but I was looking forward to all that getting fixed with the upcoming Easter story. And these women were going going to be the ones to usher that in, which of course fits into many of our personal faith stories. For how many of us is it our mother or our grandmother or a caring female Sunday school teacher who ushered us into a relationship with our Lord? But then Monday came. And I got mad. You see, on Monday morning, I sat down to work on on a message for today, for Easter Sunday. And I opened my Bible to the 16th chapter of Mark, and I read the Easter gospel, and I got mad, which is not what the Easter gospel is supposed to do to us. Did you hear the last verse of the Easter gospel? Did you hear what the women did after they found the empty tomb and and received the message from the white-robed young man? They fled the tomb and said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. So yes, I was mad and have been much of the week. The women fled the tomb out of fear and said nothing to anyone. That's not how this story is supposed to end. It's Easter. Everything is supposed to be all right. We've had enough of fumbling and confused and faithless disciples. These women were supposed to be the ones who finally get it right. So yes, I'm mad. I'm mad at Mark. You know, the the guy who wrote this story? Some call him Saint Mark, but not me. He's been a scoundrel in my mind all week. I mean, he could have given us just one follower of Jesus whom we might emulate. And doggone it, he could give me one positive thing to preach about on Easter Sunday. Confound you, Mark. Why are you taking all the joy out of the biggest holy day of the year? Now, I'm not the only person who has been mad at Mark over the ending of his gospel. For if you read directly from your Bibles, the 16th chapter of Mark, rather than from the celebrate inserts we have at church or or the words that may appear on your video screen, you will find evidence that other people were angry with the conclusion of his gospel as well. For in the Bible, there are two alternate endings to the gospel of Mark, which were most likely written by someone other than Mark. That means that in the early days of scriptures, there were others who were disturbed so much by the way Mark ended his gospel that they wrote their own ending and added it on. 
The women went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. That's the conclusion of the Easter message. What exactly are we supposed to do with that, brothers and sisters? What is your preacher supposed to tell you about an ending such as that? Do you see why I've been mad this week? But as this week has gone, my anger has waned. And a big part of that is, is due to the fact that I've realized that my reaction is precisely what Mark was trying to elicit in me. He wants me, and, and everyone who hears and experiences his gospel, he wants us to get mad. He wants us, to quote a line from a movie, he wants us to say, I'm mad and I'm not going to put up with it anymore. Dear friends in Christ, here's the deal. Mark does not end his gospel. Oh, he may have quit writing, but his gospel never actually ends. He does not give us an ending. And I don't think he ever intended to. In, in fact, he told us at the outset of his gospel that he was not going to give us an ending. Mark starts with these words. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God. In other words, Mark is saying, what I'm about to tell you, all these stories of Jesus' amazing works and teachings, the events surrounding his death, all of these things are just the beginning. And when you think about it, we know that the story does not end here. For did the women really remain silent and tell no one? If that's the case, then how do we know the story about their trip to the empty tomb? Of course, at some point, they shared the story. And the disciples, did they really desert Jesus? When he was arrested, yes, they did. And at the cross, they were nowhere to be found. But they did come back. For all these stories undoubtedly came from them. They may have been handed down by storytellers like Matthew and Luke and John, and of course by the one who received so much of my ire this week, Mark. But those authors received many of those stories from the disciples themselves. I think, I think Mark's desired reaction is for us to get angry at how everyone abandons Jesus. And in doing so, two things occur. First, he challenges us to take action. In other words, Mark shows us again and again how those around Jesus are confused and clueless and inept. Even those at the empty tomb, the women, they run away in fear. And with this, Mark implies, look, this is what all these people did. Now what are you going to do? Will you betray Jesus? Will you deny him? Will you run away in fear? Or, or will you be different? Will you bear fruit and tell others the good news? Will you make sure all people have access to God's kingdom and to the healing goodness of Jesus Christ, the Son of God? What are you going to do? And second, this abrupt ending of Mark's gospel that is not an ending at all serves to encourage us when we fail. If, if I am right that it, it was the disciples that originally told the stories to Mark in the first place, which I'm, I'm very confident that I am, then Mark's gospel ought to serve as great encouragement to us when our own faith seems to be weak. Uh, for if you say you don't have doubts, that, that you don't deny and abandon and even betray our Lord as you live out your faith, you probably aren't being honest with yourself. 
But these stories of the disciples' failures, they assure us that God will never give up on us. For as much as they failed Jesus, the Holy Spirit was still breathed into the disciples' spirits, and they passed on this faith, which has come all the way to us two millennia later. Peter is perhaps the perfect example of this. Did you catch what the white-robed man told the women? He said, go tell the disciples and Peter. And Peter. He specifically named Peter. I can envision, can envision Peter talking to Mark saying, now Mark, when you write your gospel, make sure that you tell them how much I messed up. Tell them about how I did just what Jesus said I would, that, that I denied him three times before the cock crowed. But make sure they know that even though I messed up in the worst way possible, Jesus did not give up on me. For when the women saw that angel at the tomb, he specifically told them to make sure that they tell me, Peter, that Jesus would be waiting for me in Galilee. Make sure, Mark, you tell them how much grace Jesus showed me. I'm not mad anymore, brothers and sisters. In fact, I'm actually quite thankful. For Mark has taken me through a wondrous journey from anger to joy that has emphasized the incredible grace that God has given through Jesus. So I'm thankful to St. Mark for writing the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God. And I'm thankful that, that God never gave up on Peter and the other disciples, including the women, so that the story may come to us today. And I'm thankful that the story of the good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God, continues on this day, and the conclusion has yet to be written. And I'm extra thankful on this day Easter Sunday, 2024, that I'm sharing this small piece of the good news of Jesus Christ with all of you and that we can proclaim together, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.
We are made God's people by our baptism into Christ, living together in trust and hope we confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Rejoicing that Jesus is risen and love has triumphed over fear, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need of good news. Holy God, we pray for the body of Christ, the church. Where the church is persecuted, protect it. Where the church is privileged, granted humility. Where the church is fractured, heal it. Guide us all to embody Christ's love in the world. God of grace, hear our prayer. Life-giving God, we pray for the earth, your good creation. Join our prayers with branches lifted in praise and roaring waters of new life. And together, we, mo we proclaim Easter hope. God of grace, hear our prayer. Merciful God, we pray for all peoples and nations, free, oppressed communities from occupation, exploitation, and abuse. Teach leaders your way of justice. Empower peacemakers, all who work to end violence and strife. God of grace, hear our prayer. Liberating God, we pray for people everywhere who long for good news. Roll away the stones that keep people from living with dignity and wholeness. Breathe new life and hope into people struggling to make it through each day. God of grace, hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for this community of faith and for your spirit in our midst. Feed us at your Easter table and fill us with your wisdom that we may serve and care for others. God of grace, hear our prayer. Eternal God, we remember those who have gone before us in death. Renew our trust in your promises that we live with joyful courage and compassion. God of grace, hear our prayer. Into your hands, most merciful God, we commend all whom we pray, trusting in your abiding love through Jesus Christ, our resurrected and living Lord. Amen. Amen. There are many other events at Heart of Illinois Lutheran. We'd love to have you join us for them as well. For more info on them, check out our websites and newsletter and or contact us by phone, email, or good old-fashioned snail mail. Please join us weekly for worship. We'd love to have you as part of our worshiping community. We gather Sunday mornings at Emmanuel at 8.30 a.m. and at First Lutheran at 10.30 a.m. and online at your convenience. We'd very much appreciate it if you would consider making a monetary contribution to help maintain the mission of Heart of Illinois Lutheran Parish. You can give online via Venmo or by post.
let us pray. Risen one, you call us to believe and bear fruit. May the gifts that we offer here be signs of your abiding love. Form us to be your witnesses in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our true vine. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia! The God of resurrection power, the Christ of unending joy, and the spirit of Easter hope, bless you now and always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.